Katie, as we've been telling you, investigators have started to track down the thousands of leads across the country already pouring in. In the last couple of days, they've searched a number of homes and businesses in Florida. NBC's Kerry Sanders is in Miami with more on that. Kerry? Well, the FBI, and I'm outside their headquarters right now, are focusing on five Florida men, all with Middle Eastern sounding names, all, it's believed, who died in the hijackings. 33 year old Mohammed Atta, believed to be one of the suicide pilots, trained to fly right here in the United States, attending this flight school in Venice, Florida, with his younger cousin Marwan Al Shahi, both in school here for seven months last year flying this twin-engine Seneca for their commercial pilot's licenses. NBC News has learned they each received FAA commercial pilot's licenses December 21st last year. The designated pilot examiner who tested a Todd his cousin, saying neither stands out in his memory. They're, they were just average people. If, if there had been anything in particular, I'm sure I would have remembered it, but they were just uh, uh, two more pilots that went through. Flight school owner Rudy Deckers saying 60% of his students are foreigners. Like everybody else, uh, I'm absolutely shocked. Ali Azan from Oman, a fellow student pilot, remembers Atta saying he was from Egypt, his cousin from the United Arab Emirates, both men keeping to themselves. I tried to invite them a lot of times to come out with us and that did not. FBI agents in Vero Beach, Florida, serving search warrants on a location where other suspected suicide pilots may have once lived. In Hollywood, Florida overnight, investigators using infrared and ultraviolet lights to find fingerprints and other clues at a house where it's believed Atta rented a room. A similar scene in Hamburg, Germany, where both Atta and his cousin once had an apartment. Police there sealing the neighborhood, then taking a woman into custody for questioning. But where do all the clues lead investigators? Like this car rented by Al Shahi, now at FBI headquarters in Miami. Agents found an address in the glove box that took them to a post office box at a mailboxes, et cetera, 40 miles away. That box in yet another man's name. And the authorities now wanting to know who that man is, trying to locate him, to talk to him. The investigators not only want to find the evidence that they're, they're boxing up, but what that evidence will lead them to in some sort of, where was the finances coming for all of this? Where was the money coming from? One of the records that they found that we, we also have a copy of is a car rental agreement that uh, uh, Muhammad Atta was uh, able to do uh, just last month, and he used a visa card. So the authorities right over here, the FBI, have that information. They're looking at it, and they're trying to find out where the money was coming from, and does it point back to anybody in particular, Osama bin Laden, or where, where was the money coming from? Matt? Marwan al Shahi was born in Ras al-Kalama on May 9th, 1978, in the United Arab Emirates, to a Muslim cleric who died in 1997, and an Egyptian mother. Described as a quiet and devout Muslim, Details about Al Shahi's life in the United Arab Emirates, however, are difficult to acquire. According to an October 2001 article in the New York Times, if residents of Mr. Shahi's hometown had heard of him before now, they were certainly not telling strangers. Four hours spent in the community yielded no address, and no one, policemen, firemen, pedestrians, or local officials, who did anything more than shrug at the mention of his name. Upon graduating from high school in 1995, Al-Shahi enlisted in the Emirati military and received a half a year of basic training where he was admitted, admitted into a military scholarship program that allowed him to continue his education in Germany. Upon arriving in Germany in April of 1996, Al-Shahi moved into an apartment which he shared with three other scholarship students for two months before boarding with a local German family. Several months later, he moved into his own apartment. Those who knew him described Al Shahi as a very religious and friendly individual who wore Western clothes and sometimes rented cars for trips to Berlin, France, and the Netherlands. His teacher in Germany, Gabrielle Brock, recalls him as someone who seemed to be struggling to have plans to the future while studying here. 
Al Shahi was not from a very wealthy family compared to his other classmates from the Emirates. He was the only one who only had a small room and didn't keep talking about the wealth of his families, recalls the teacher, Brock. He once told her that his mother was Egyptian and had a serious eye disease. That's why he wanted to bring her to Germany for an operation, he told the class. The German teacher recalls that his father died shortly before the trip to Germany. Al Shahi apparently had no other clear goals. He didn't even know what he wanted to do with his life. Together with three other compatriots, Al Shahi learned German vocabulary and grammar from Gabriel Brock. Together with students from Egypt, Morocco, India, China, Vietnam, and the US, Al Shahi was supposed to learn the first bits of German in eight weeks and paid 3,000 marks to the Institute for the intensive course from April to June. Brock had been teaching foreign students the German language in these courses for years with short stories, comic drawings, and sign language. During the spring of 1996, Al-Shehi volunteered for the UAE Army shortly after leaving high school. He is said to have learned German, but his teacher Brock tried the best that she could, knowing that she dropped out of the military. She didn't make anything of it. But by 1997, Marwan Al-Shehi would visit the Philippines several times this year. He stays at the Woodland Park Resort Hotel near Angeles City, about 60 miles north of Manila and near the former U.S. controlled Clark Air Base. Security guard Antonio Sarosa later would claim, I'm sure Al Shea had been a Woodland guest several times in 1997. I remember him well because I flagged his speeding car at least three times at the gate of Woodland. He adds that Al Shea used different cars knew how to speak some Filipino, and stayed at the hotel on several Saturdays. Other eyewitnesses will later recall al Shahi and another man, Muhammad Atta, at the Woodland Hotel in 1999, and the Philippine military will confirm their presence there. On November 2nd, 1997, Marwan al Shahi would apply for a visa in the home country, the United Arab Emirates, respectively, at the U.S. Embassy in Abu Dhabi. He would also apply on June 18th of 2001 and at a consul in Dubai on January 18th of 2000. It seemed that U.S. visas would be handed out in many different areas, but most of them at the Riyadh Hotel, at the Riyadh Consulate, where 15 of the Saudi hijackers, both 9-11, would apply for their visas. In the summer of 1998, Muhammad Atta and a group of his radical Islamist friends moved into an apartment in Williamsburg, an island of the Elbe River in the middle of Hamburg, Germany. This area is a rundown industrial zone. It is unclear who all the members of the group living in the apartment are, but Warren al Shahi and Ramzi bin al Sheikh live here. For the first time, this group becomes very closely tied together. They live an extremely simple life with nothing but mattresses for furniture and no electrical devices except for lights. Neighbors will later say the men in the apartment will talk long into the night, nearly every night, with the blinds and the windows permanently closed. The group moves to a nicer apartment on November 8th, November 1st of 1998. Omar Wan al-Shehi had met Muhammad Atta in Germany when he was transferring to the Technical University of Hamburg. Al Shea was a poor student here and he was directed by the scholarship program administrators to repeat a semester of his studies back in Bonn beginning in August of 98. Al Shea did not enroll back in Bonn until January of 99 and continued to struggle with his studies here. Al 
Al Shehi would move to Hamburg in 98 as he would start going to the Al Quds Mosque, where he met other members just like him Muhammad Atta, Ramzi bin Al Shib, Saeed Bahaji, Manir Al Mutasek. The mosque is a radical mosque known for its fiery anti Western views. In March of 99, German intelligence gives the CIA the first name of a 9-11 hijacker, Marwan al Shehi, and his telephone number of a phone registered in the United Arab Emirates. The Germans learned the information from the surveillance of an Al-Qaeda Hamburg cell member, Mohammed Haydar Zamar. They tell the CIA that al Shehi, who was living in Bonn, Germany at the time, he may be connected to Al-Qaeda. He is described as a UAE student who has spent some time studying in Germany. The conversation is short but a known alias of Marmoon Dar Gonzali is mentioned. The CIA is very interested in Dar Gonzali and will try to recruit him as an informant later in the year. In April of 1999, Muhammad Atta takes flying lessons in the Philippines. Marwan al Shehi is also with him. They stay at the Woodland Park Resort Hotel near Angela City, which is about 60 miles north of the Manila base. Al Shehi was remembered to have visited here two years prior. One of the club members would later say, Atta was not very friendly. If you say the hello to him, he doesn't answer. If he asks for a towel, you do not enter his room. He takes it at the door. Many times I saw him let a girl go at the gate in the morning. It was always a different girl. Atta stays with some other men who call him Muhammad. She recalls that one of them is Marwan Al Shehi who is treated like Ada's sidekick. However, there are no recollections of Al-Shehi going to the nearby flight school. She says Ada was hosted by a Jordanian named Samir, who speaks Filipino and runs a travel agency in Manila. She adds that many Arab guests stayed at the hotel between 1997 and 1999, and Samir always had accompanied them. Samir would later deny knowing any of these two men. The Philippine military will later confirm that Atta and al Shehi were at the hotel after finding four other employees who claimed to have seen them in 1997 and 1999. In October of 1999, Marwan al Shehi would take flying lessons in Bonn, Germany. He takes a lesson in ultralight two-seaters and then returns 10 days later for a second lesson. His former teacher will later recall, the young man was highly attentive and especially talented. However, there are reports that Muhammad Atta also takes lessons on ultralight aircraft in the Philippines in 1999. In June of 2000, after arriving in the U.S. on May 29th and June 3rd of 2000, Marwan al Shehi and Muhammad Atta meet up and reportedly spend all of June in the New York area. The 9 11 Commission would later report them spending the month staying in a series of short term rentals in New York City while searching for a flight school to attend, emailing a New Hampshire school on June 5th, and inquiring with a New Jersey school on June 22nd. A day after arriving in the US, Atta receives a mobile phone. He bought listing his address as an Oklahoma flight school he subsequently visits. According to the FBI, al Shehi enrolls at an English language school and the pair remained in the area until June 2nd. However, some accounts suggest they leave before this. And according to the owner of the Venice flight school, subsequently attended by Ada and al Shehi, the pair first visit the school on July 1st. And according to the later statement of a local sheriff, some of the hijackers, including Ata, may live and take flight lessons in Puente Gorda, Florida, prior to moving to Venice. After 9-11, a federal investigator will later reveal that Atta and Al Shea rented rooms in the Bronx and Brooklyn in spring of 2000. Whether this included the period prior to when Atta officially first entered the U.S. in June is unstated. In September of 2000, while living in the U.S., 
some of the 9-11 hijackers make at least 206 international phone calls. In 2006, these calls will be mentioned in a German intelligence report based on telephone records obtained from the FBI. A majority of the calls are made from a cell phone registered to Marwan al Shahi. Additional details on who was called, who else made the calls, when the calls were made, what other countries were called, etc., have not been made public. The Chicago Tribune will later note that the calls to Germany are not surprising since al Shahi and some others were living there, but the hijackers' connections to Saudi Arabia and Syria are far from fully explained. It is unknown when these calls were discovered, but reports suggest at least some of the hijackers' international calls were being monitored by U.S. intelligence as they were being made. Somewhere between April and May of 2000, Al Marwan al Shahi would boast of planning an attack to a librarian in Hamburg, Germany. He would later say, there will be thousands of dead. You will think of me. He also specifically mentions the World Trade Center. You will see, al Shahi adds, in America, something is going to happen. There will be many people killed. The British Guardian would later note that this demonstrates that the members of the Hamburg cell were not quite as careful to keep secret their plans as had previously been thought. In addition, it appears to bury for good the theory that the pilots were informed of their targets only hours before they took off. Not least, though, Marwan al Shahi's boats provides a key element for the reconstruction of the plot, a date by which the terrorists had decided on their target. On July 1st of 2000, Mohammed Atta and Marwan al Shahi moved from New York to Venice, Florida. They arrived at Huffman Aviation, a flying school at Venice Municipal Airport, on July 1st, according to the school's owner, Rudy Deckers, inquiring about taking lessons there. They are reported to also check out a flight school in Oklahoma at the beginning of the month. Then they return to Huffman, and on July 3rd, according to Deckers, begin flight instruction, subsequently enrolling in the school's accelerated pilot program, where they register at the school, Atta and El Shea use their real names. Deckers later states that they say they are unhappy with a flying school they attended up north, though he gives no details about the identity of the school. It will later be claimed that Atta and al Shahi attended the flight school in Puente Gorda before moving to Venice. However, Puente Gorda is south, not north of Venice. Paying by check, Atta will give $18,703 in total for his lessons, while al Shahi gives $20,917. The money necessary to cost to cover their training is sent to them in a series of wire transfers from Dubai. Between August 14th and December 19th of 2000, Marwan al Shahi and Mohammed Atta passed various pilot tests at Huffman Aviation. On August 14th of 2000, according to the 9 11 Commission, they passed their private pilot airplane test with Atta scoring 97 out of 100 and al Shahi scoring 83. However, Huffman's owner, Rudy Deckers, will later testify before Congress that Atta already had a private pilot's license when he first arrived at the school six weeks previously. Despite having failed their stage one exam for instruments rating at nearby Jones Aviation a month earlier, on November 6th, Atta and al Shahi passed their instrument rating airplane tests at Huffman, scoring 90 and 75 respectively. And on December 19th, they passed their commercial pilot's licensing tests thus completing their training, with Atta scoring 93 and al Shahi 73. According to a 2005 Federal Aviation Administration fact sheet, the passing score for all the pilot tests Atta and al Shahi take is 70. Presumably, this is, all the, this is also the case in 2000. Yet one fellow student who witnessed the pair at Huffman on an almost daily basis later state that while he was always accompanied Akka during his flying lessons, she never saw Al Shahi at the controls of the training aircraft. Rudy Deckers will later state, I have heard from the instructors that they were average students. The examiner told me the same. The local FAA designated examiner, Dave Whitman, is responsible for testing Atta and Al Shahi. 
he issues them temporary 100-day licenses, allowing them to fly small twin-engine planes. He will later say he assumes the FAA made their licenses permanent as he was not notified otherwise. He said, I don't even remember them specifically. They were foreign students. And foreign students often tend to keep to themselves. In the months before September of 2000, according to an anonymous Able Danger official speaking to the Bergen record, a U.S. Army intelligence unit tasked with assembling information about Al-Qaeda networks worldwide discovered that several of the 9-11 hijackers are taking rooms at motels in New Jersey and meeting together there. The intelligence unit called Able Danger, which uses high-speed computers to analyze vast amounts of data, notices that Muhammad Atta and Marwan al shahi take a room at the Wayne Inn. After the existence of the Able Danger unit comes to light in 2005, the Bergen Record columnist and reporter Mike Kelly said the connect the dots tracking by the team was so good that it even knew Atta conducted meetings with the three future hijackers. One of those meetings took place at the Wayne Inn. That's how close all this was to us and to being solved. If only the information had been passed up the line to FBI agents or even to local cops. This new piece of 9-11 history revealed only last week by a Pennsylvania congressman, Kurt Weldon, and confirmed by two former members of the intelligence team, Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer and Eric Kleinsmith of the Land Information Warfare's Activities Division, could turn out to be one of the most explosive revelations since the publication last summer of the 9-11 Commission report. The other two hijackers said to be present at the meetings were Nawapa Hazmi and Khalid al-Midar. They periodically live in the town of Patterson, New Jersey, only one mile away from Wayne. However, contradicting this account, a lawyer representing members of Able Danger later would testify, at no time did Able Danger identify Muhammad Atta as being physically present in the United States. However, he would later contradict that statement under the Crow's questioning. Some media accounts have stated that the Able Danger program determined Atta was in the U.S. before 9-11. For instance, Fox News reported in August of 2005 that Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer is standing by his claim that he told him that the lead hijacker in the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks had been identified in the summer of 2000 as an Al-Qaeda operative living openly in the United States. In December of 2000, according to later German reports, a whole horde of Israeli counterterrorism investigators posing as art students followed the trails of Arab terrorists and their cells in the United States. In the town of Hollywood, Florida, they identify Muhammad Atta and Marwan al shahi as possible terrorists living in the vicinity of the apartment of two seemingly normal flight school students observing them around the clock. Supposedly, around April, the Israeli agents are discovered and deported, terminating the investigation. On August 23, 2001, according to German newspapers, the Mossad give the CIA a list of 19 terrorists living in the United States and say that they appear to be planning to carry out attacks in the near future. It is unknown if these are the 19 9-11 hijackers or if their number is a coincidence. However, four names on the list are known. Nawafa Hazmi, Khalid al-Midar, Marwan al shahi and Muhammad Atta. The Mossad appeared to have learned about this through its art student spy ring. Yet, apparently, this warning and list are not treated as particularly urgent by the CIA, and the information is not passed on to the FBI. It is unclear whether this warning influenced the decision to add Al-Hazmi and Al-Midar to her terrorism watch list on the same day, and if so, why only those two? Israel has continually denied past and currently, that there were any Mossad agents in the U.S. However, multiple reports contradicted those statements.
Between January and March of 2001, according to the FBI and the 9-11 Commission, Muhammad Atta and Marwan al shi moved temporarily to Georgia on January 25, 2001, staying briefly in No Cross and Decatur near Atlanta. The FBI will later say the hijackers remain in the Atlanta area during February and March. And according to several news reports, between late February and early March, Atta and al shi twice visit the Advanced Aviation Flight Training School in nearby Lawrenceville. They pay $171 in total, and on both occasions, rent a small Piper Warrior plane for an hour. They are accompanied by an instructor on the first occasion, who will fly alone the second time. According to the school's owner, Bruce Buell, the two are well-dressed, polite, and friendly. The two days after 9-11, Chrissy Ross, a flight dispatcher at the school, will recognize Otto's name when the identities of the suspected hijackers are made public. She calls the FBI, whose agents then come and take all the school's records. However, the FBI would later claim that Atta and al Shei visit advanced aviation about a month earlier than the news reports suggest, on January 31st and February 6th. In April of 2001, Marwan al Shei would possibly enter and photograph the cockpit of an American Airlines Boeing 757 during a flight from Boston to Los Angeles. This is according to a flight attendant working in first class whose account is mentioned in a 2002 FBI document about the 9-11 attacks. She will claim that Al Shahi approached her while boarding, tells her he has recently received his pilot's license and asks to see the cockpit. Later in the flight, he meets and speaks with the pilot and possibly photographs the pilot and cockpit. In the summer of 2001, the Associated Press will report in May of 2002 that Israeli intelligence services were aware several months before 9-11 that bin Laden was planning a large-scale terrorist attack but did not know what his targets would be. Israeli officials have said. An Israeli official speaking on condition of anonymity would later tell the Associated Press shortly after the attacks that everybody knew about a heightened alert, knew that bin Laden was preparing a big attack. He said information was passed on to Washington, but denied Israel had any concrete intelligence that could have been used to prevent the September 11th attacks. The claim that Israel lacks concrete intelligence is contradicted by media reports. And at some point between these dates of August 8th and 15th, Israel, who warned that the U.S. would be under an attack by an al-Qaeda operative and operatives inside the United States. Reportedly, two ranking ex-agents from the Mossad came to Washington and warned the FBI and the CIA that from 50 to 200 terrorists have slipped into the United States and are planning a major assault on the United States. The Los Angeles Times later retracts its story after a CIA spokesman would later say that there was no such warning and allegations that they were a complete and utter nonsense. However, other newspapers do not retract it. The reason for this is simple. The Israelis had multiple spy rings spying on multiple operatives of the Hamburg cell in Florida, New York, and New Jersey. All of this information was suppressed later by the State Department and the FBI. September 11th, 2001. At some time between the hours of 6.52 a.m. and 6.55 a.m., a three-minute call is made from a payphone at Boston's Logan Airport in the gate area from where Flight 175 will later depart. The 9-11 Commission will report that they presume al Shahi made the call, but we cannot be sure. According to the Commission, this is Atta and al Shahi's final conversation. According to other reports, though, they later speak again briefly by cell phone while waiting for their planes to take off before 7.59 a.m.
However, the anomalies don't stop there. The reports also don't stop there. For in the night before September 11, 2001, somewhere between 8 and 8.45 p.m. on September 10th, a group of five Middle Eastern men, which include two men who will later be identified as Nawafa Hazmi and Marwan al Shahi, get into a confrontation with Eric Gill, an employee at Washington Dulles International Airport from where Flight 77 will later take off on September 11th. After they try to get to a secure area of the airport, Gill, who works for Argon Bright Security, which handles the passenger security checkpoints at Dulles Airport, notices the men while supervising the West checkpoint on the upper level of the airport's main terminal, where Flight 77 is parked at the tarmac. He initially sees just two of them as they try to go through a side door next to the checkpoint that only a few people are permitted to use. People can use this door to bypass the checkpoint, but they need to swipe a card and enter a code on a keypad to pass through it. Going through the door enables a person to reach the airport secure employee only areas, including where the areas are parked, where the planes are parked. One of the men trying to go through the door is wearing a green ID badge with a red A on it of the kind typically worn by the air, airport's baggage, ramp and services personnel. However, use of this door is restricted to police, security personnel and government officials. Gill notices the other three Middle Eastern men following the first two. Two of these men are also wearing green ID badges with red A's on them. Gill will describe one of the men as Arabic or Palestinian and the other four as Middle Eastern. He will say the men appear to be aged between 30 and 35 and between five feet seven and five feet nine in height. The three men with ID badges are wearing dull gray striped shirts and blue pants, like the uniform worn by United Airlines ramp workers. None of the men are carrying anything and Gill does not recognize any of them. As the men are approaching the side door, they stop and look around for a few moments, as if they are examining security procedures at the checkpoint. Gill would find this unusual. He would say, normally, people who had legitimate business would keep walking because they know where they were going and what they were doing. One of the men would swipe his ID card and enter a code into a keypad in order to open the side door and allow the group to go through it. But Gill is suspicious and goes up to the men. After asking he can, if he can help, he refuses to let them proceed through the door. The men who have ID cards show them to him, but he then notices that the other two men are not wearing uniforms and have no airport identification. And so he tells these men they cannot enter the security area unless they have their own IDs with them. Gill would ask the men who they are and why they are trying to go through the side door, but they give no answer. He tells the two men without IDs that they have to come back through the door, but they say they have IDs and are going to continue on their way. Around this time, Gill is joined by his colleague, Nicholas De Silva, who subsequently witnessed the rest of the incident. Gill then notices the uniform worn by the three men are very dirty, which strikes them as odd, since United Airlines managers would not usually tolerate this. He refuses to let the men in uniforms escort the other two men through the side door and says the men without IDs will have to go through the main security checkpoint. At this point, the men get angry and become abusive. One of them tells Gil to fuck off and says they are important people he doesn't know. Next, however, instead of the men without IDs simply passing through the security checkpoint as requested, all of the men retreat, which surprised Gil. They then head off and go down the stairs that lead to the lower level of the main terminal. Gill will never see them again. However, Ed Nelson, who's his supervisor, will note that if they wanted to access a plane at the airport, perhaps to plant weapons on it, they could have returned after 10 p.m. when Gill's ship ended and used the ID cards to activate the electronic lock and pass through the side door next to the West checkpoint. The exact time when Gill's confrontation with the five men occur is unclear, but Gill will tell the FBI that it occurred during the approximate time period of 8.10 to 8.45 p.m. And he will later tell the 9-11 Commission that it occurred around 8 p.m. 
He will later tell investigative journalist Joe Trento and Susan Trento that it occurred at 8.15 p.m. The incident is not unusual enough to necessitate the report, and so Gill will take no further action this evening. But he will report it after he comes into work at 1 p.m. the following day and hears about the hijacking of Flight 77. Gill would subsequently identify two of the men he confronted as 9-11 hijackers, Nawaf Hazmi and Marwan al -Shaid. A week or two after 9-11, his wife will show him a story in the National Enquirer magazine that includes photos of the alleged hijackers, and he would recognize two of them as having been among the group he encountered. And at some point after this, he will be shown the photos of the alleged hijackers that are published on the FBI website by Steve Ragg, the district manager in charge of Dulles Airport for Argonne Bright Security. From looking at these, he would identify two of the men he confronted as Flight 77 hijackers Al Hazmi and Flight 175 hijacker Marwan Al Shehi. He will say that these two hijackers were among the men wearing uniforms and ID badges. He will also recognize Al Shehi as the first man to have shown him his ID and Al Hazmi as the man who verbally abused him. On September 13, 2001, and on, I'm sorry, September 11, 2001, in the evening hours, the FBI would find Marwan al Shehi's rental car, which was discovered at Boston Logan's airport, containing an Arabic language flight manual, a pass giving access to restricted areas at the airport, and documents containing a name on the passenger list of one of the flights and the names of other suspects. The name of the flight school where Arthur and al Shehi studied Huffman Aviation is also found in the car. But what do we make of Marwan al Shehi? How do we know anything about him without knowing about his background before he came to Germany? According to his teacher, Gabriel Brock, the life of Marwan al Shehi in Bonn was based on fixed rules. She would say on Fridays, he always came to class with a jacket and tie because he wanted to pray afterwards. To this end, al Shehi visited a prayer room in the embassy of the United Arab Emirates in Bonn, in Hamburg, in the United States. Was his religion, his essence, and what would make him turn from the friendly, affable young man, known for his jokes, known for his shyness, known to not have a long-term goal in life, would make him believe in such an abrogated version of his faith that would lead him to harm maim and kill innocent civilians for a goal that had no end. Brock would later say that Al Shehi had never made any political statements in his class either. I'm sure it wasn't radical back then. I would have noticed his inconspicuous was the biggest problem for investigators because how are the authorities supposed to recognize and observe people who do nothing conspicuous? In retrospect, however, his teacher was sure to notice some things. For example, he was only out and about with his compatriots in his free time. She would later say, actually the people from the Emiratis always talk about their jobs, but Wawin never did. He also never had a dream job. And he also, she also recorded that he had a youthful carelessness about life and about his future. <laughs>